This is the Bod Pod. Hey, Bod Pod Squad. I'm Rachel K. Grimm, the confidence coach behind Ditch the Click and your Bod Pod host. Every week from my cute Brooklyn apartment, I'm bringing you all of the confidence boosting resources and conversations from some of our favorites in the space. And today we have Danielle or Danny Farage, who is a top 50 future of work influencer, community builder, educator, speaker, and top voice for Gen Z. She is bridging the generational gap, the divide in the workplace. Danny, I'm so happy you're here. Thanks for coming on the pod. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Like, oh my gosh. Yes. Before this, I was talking about a comedy show I went to last night and they were talking all about like people getting fired and just the crazy stuff that happens. And with a title like yours, where you are speaking about confidence in the workplace, you're empowering people to have difficult conversations, go after what they want, bridge that divide and just end the workplace gap. It made me think there must be something underlying that happened in your work experience that led you to this. I think for me, it was more about my personal experience of loneliness yeah which is being widely talked about today it's a hot topic and I hope it never falls out of trend because mental health and loneliness are two really important things that should always be talked about and I think this generation specifically like Gen Z is particularly really good at talking about mental health but as far as like workplace and people as a whole being ready to have that conversation. I think there are definitely varying degrees. And that's one of the things that I think about and I talk about. So going back, let's go back in time to seven years old. I grew up in New York City. I was, I remember being in my New York City apartment and Upper West Side and not Brooklyn. And I would play like pretend workplace, right? Yeah. And I just remember my job was to make sure that everyone had a voice and felt heard and could contribute. Yeah. I have chills. That that was like literally, and I didn't even know what the business did. I was like so oblivious. I had no idea what what being a businesswoman meant. I just knew that I cared about the people. Yeah. And so when I went to college and I studied psychology and I saw this, this sort of problem arising in the world that like, people were looked at and treated in organizations as cogs in a wheel. And I just thought that was so fucked up. And I wanted to essentially study social sciences to get to know people, to be able to talk to them about what interests them, yeah, learn about them as people, and then yeah. take what I learned back to the boardroom to help them make better decisions about people. Yeah of course, in a business oriented way, but I don't believe that you have to choose. It's one or the other. Let me treat people like shit so that the business could continue. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And and thrive. It could be the same, right? It it could be that you treat people well. And that actually is a cyclical thing that feeds into the business being profitable as well. When I was graduating, I had met this woman my senior year at a conference at USC, and it was a conference focused on women, particularly, which I think is interesting. Yeah. And essentially, we just hit it off. She was building a startup that was focused on helping college students find career paths that were relevant to them. And I was actually starting a class that semester, the next semester, focused on entrepreneurship. And my idea for the class was to help college students find career paths that were relevant to them. So it was just like this crazy thing where it was shared. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, great. Perfect. I'll just go work for her. Yeah. And that was the idea. And so we ended up getting drinks like a few Mm -hmm. weeks later and we hit it off and she told me her whole life story. And I just felt really connected to her. I felt like I had met someone who was going to change my life for the better. Yeah. You have to understand as well, like this is a time when I was graduating. No one really tells you to network or how to network. And regardless of the fact that I was in LA, essentially, a place that's super well connected, I still had little to no clue how to actually build my network. And so essentially I went into this experience and I started my second half of my senior year working for her. 
it was a small team and the first two months were amazing. We'd have this, these mm-hmm. long conversations, just me and her. And she was an ex recruiter. So she would tell me like, oh, this career path leads to this and it's for this kind of person. So I was learning about myself in the process of also helping the business yeah. teach other people which career paths that could be great for them. And so yeah. I thought it was really great mission driven company as well. And so essentially then the pandemic happened. Of course. About three years ago. First and- two months were amazing. <laughs> pandemic happens. Exactly. And I ended up going back to the East Coast. This was obviously a West Coast internship. And I continued working for her. Now there were red flags I didn't really pay attention to, like her wanting to talk on the weekend or after work about the company and about the job and and content and all this stuff. And of course I was perpetuating it. I wasn't saying no because I was excited, but I think it was that excitement was abused. Yeah. And then more flags started coming down the pipe. It was like, in May, right, I was graduating and I was trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do if she can't offer me a full-time job? Cause it's an early startup. We weren't yet profitable. Right. I need to start thinking about like my career path. And she right. had previously told me, Oh, I'll be there for you. Like I'll help you find a job, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And suddenly anytime I brought up like looking for jobs, she attacked me mm-hmm. verbally. Yeah. And soon after that, I took full time with her as an internship for the summer. And she basically every morning after we had our team call, she would say, Hey, Danielle, can you stay on for a few minutes? And a few minutes turned into a few more minutes and then an hour. (laughs) And suddenly I was like, literally being attacked, like for no reason, essentially. Like I was, she was asking me to like, basically lead a team of like 10 interns who had never had an internship before. And it was like this whole really messed up thing. It was not ethical business practices. So anyway, a fast forward, I was in August of 2020 sitting in my house and I decided to make a Benjamin Franklin list and where you sit down pros and cons. And I was like, okay, pros of leaving mental health going up cons of staying mental health going down and that was the moment that I knew I needed to leave and I think what happened after that was three weeks later I found a job at a startup that was amazing and my boss (laughs) was incredible and the juxtaposition of those two experiences is what helped me to realize how alone I was how depressed I was I wasn't getting out of my pajamas in the morning because Mm -hmm. I was so depressed. How bad I felt about myself, both mentally, spiritually, physically, everything. Mm -hmm. It was Mm -hmm. triggering me. And last but not least, how I wanted to use that experience to help people avoid being abused the way that I was realistically. And that served as truly the power behind sharing my story publicly, which is a whole other thing, owning your story. Yeah. And then going on to become a top voice and an advocate for not only this generation, but I feel that there are problems that exist intergenerationally. And if we focus on how can we respect each other and come to the table and learn from each other and listen to each other and just be open, how much better the world could really become. There was recently an article that you contributed to in the New York Post, and you were talking about mentors, mentees, mentorship in general. And you got me thinking about my relationship with my assistant who started with me as an intern and then truly pitched herself to me of, you need an assistant. I was like, girl, you know me better than I do. You're right. I I do need an assistant. And in her pitching me in about it. She said to me afterwards, she was like, wow, you really made me feel so comfortable in this conversation. You made me feel like I could talk about the things that I want and why I want them, the things that I need, why I need them. And Mm. I said to her, I was like, honestly, thank you so much for saying that. Because I remember at early parts of my career going into conversations or maybe sometimes actually totally avoiding conversations completely. Oh yeah. But then sometimes going into conversations and just feeling like 
the other person was either speaking over me or making me feel less than that I couldn't actually communicate what I wanted and what I needed. Maybe I am the first person she's had this conversation with, but I'm definitely not the last. Like she will have those conversations again in the future. And just as much as, yes, I gave her that opportunity to speak, I also felt like she was mentoring me in that moment for me to know how in the future I'm going to also have more conversations like that. And so when I read your article in the post, I loved that you were talking about that relationship between the mentor and the mentee and how it's not necessarily this like hierarchical thing. Oh, I can't say that word. Hierarchical? Hierarchical. Hierarchical. There we go. Yeah, that. we got it. It's not that. <laughs> it really is this true relationship of, of the yeah. two. And so I, I want to talk about that a little bit first, whether you want to talk about the article itself or just like the inspiration behind that. I love what you just shared because actually one of the things I talk about in mentorship, and I'm building this model literally as I'm going, yeah. it's so powerful, partly because just a friendship, just like yeah. Or any relationship where it's a healthy thing to have monthly check-ins where you're like, yes. Hey, this is what you're doing really well. Here are some things you can improve on and create that constant feedback loop yeah. to help inform not only your own actions, but how you respond to them yeah. in the future and how you communicate like defines the relationship. And so when I think about friendorship and I think about my own friendorships, it really, for me, my relationships began to unlock when I stopped thinking about mentors as mentors, as this bucket of like people who I could only access a few times a year and who like I would be asking so much of and who were and who I'm knew less so than much them. And I'm yes. less than them exactly because yeah. that puts you in that category. Yeah. As soon as I started to think of them as my friends, yeah, those relationships unlocked and I was able to be my authentic self. And not only that, but I think that part of this whole friendship thing and the reason it's so crucial is because it encourages that constant feedback loop of, hey, since our last conversation, I've spoken about you in these spaces where mm -hmm. I've used what you sent me or what you shared on XYZ podcasts, sharing and verbalizing those things helps the other person to know what is valuable. Yeah. Not only to you, but also to other people. And I think especially as a thought leader, it's important for me to know I, I'm biased. I can't know which ideas of mine are going to hit. It communicates what a friendship should be, but in the context of learning from each yes. other. Yes. Because work so often is just revolved around this like exchange of things, Transactional. right? Like what I, yes, what I can get from you and what you can get from me. And I feel like in you defining that as friendship, as you said, it, takes away literally what you're doing, that divide, right? You said that is what you do is you help people bridge that divide, bridge that gap. And in defining it as a friendorship, it does exactly that. And I love it. I think about when you were having that conversation with that person and she said, thank you. And you said, you don't have to thank me. I think so often about how whether it's in a friendorship situation of, of work or for me, I do, obviously I coach, right? I do a lot of confidence coaching and people will come to me and they'll be like, thank you so much Be because of you, I was able to do this and this. And I'm like, first of all, I accept that. I appreciate that positive feedback. So you, but I also want to recognize that like, I could have just spoken that to you and you could have done nothing with it. Like it could have just existed in the air, but you had to actually take that and apply it to the situation that you're in and make it possible to make change. And isn't that what we do in a friendship is we can give people all the advice they want, all the recommendations, whatever, but it's up to them actually to apply it. It's up to us to apply it. And if we don't actually apply it, it's like, it didn't exist anyway. Can we talk a little bit about conflict and yeah. from what you're just saying there, like that could easily be something that leads to 
conflict. And I really want to talk about workplace conflict, though. I have a three-step program. Oh, we love uh, yeah, our initiative, yes. whatever you yes. want to call it. <laughs> and essentially, I, I just want to preface this by saying I did not come up with this on my own. Totally. I, yes. when I landed my job as director of marketing for CAFE, I had an incredible amount of weakness and competence, which is what I call imposter syndrome. Yes. And when that happened, when I started that job, I realized I needed some coaching. I needed someone to help me overcome this weakness and confidence. And I invested in myself. Granted, I was living at home. So I had the ability to actually spend what I would spend on rent on personal growth. And I invested in a mindset coach, pretty much the same cost as a therapist if you're paying out of pocket. And I just want to preface it by saying that because I wouldn't be here speaking right now about this and giving advice if it wasn't informed by someone who is much more experienced in this area. And I just want to say that also because most people don't really think about investing in themselves in that way. And yeah. Yes. And it's thank God for coaches and people like yourself who are actually doing this work oh, and helping yeah. people who are ready to invest in themselves, but you, it's never too early to do. Yes. I was literally just having this conversation with a girl that I coach. She, we had her like last chat and which is what I call them. And she was like, this was such a great spend of my money. And I said to her, mm. I was like, The way I see it is, as you said, it's an investment in yourself because it really does empower you in so many different areas of your life. And it also is a moment that to what you just said is only for you, solely for you. There is, I'm not talking about me. Like I might give you advice from my point of view, right? But it's not about me. It's not about your partner or your child or your best friend. Like it's a moment that is just for you. And that is so powerful. And the fact that you just like praise that person so much is so kind. Like what you're saying, hey, I have this three step, but just so you know, it's not necessarily all mine. I think it's one of the biggest compliments ever to be like, oh, I was inspired by this person who literally changed my life with their tips and resources. J- Dr. Jill Kahn met her through Clubhouse, <laughs> whether you think that's cool or not. She's amazing. And she, her story is incredible. So anyway, the three steps. So this is if you find yourself in a situation where someone says something to you that is triggering or you view as maybe negative or something that, you know, you take not so well. Take a deep breath, first of all, and assume best intent. This is something I struggled with personally with my own mother and overcoming our relationship, which is also something I worked on a lot in my mindset coaching. And it's something that helped me navigate my intergenerational relationship with her. And it's something that will likely help you. And so always assume best intent that other people are not intentionally trying to hurt you or act in a way that prevents you from exceeding and doing well, but that they're really trying to be there for you. Now, that's not to say that will be the case 100% because at the end of the day, we all know we are looking out for ourselves first, right? No one walks around always thinking about other people. Yeah. So the next thing I would say after you assume best intent and to take a deep breath is to ask if you feel comfortable and ready in the moment, what do you mean by that? Hmm. Just ask for clarity. And oftentimes they're not going to say, oh, they're just not just going to repeat what they said. They're going to explain the thought process behind it or something Mm -hmm. else that they didn't maybe mention. And so once you have collected all of that information, you then I would say either respond if you feel like it was cleared up or if you still feel triggered or hurt or confused, say, I'd love to close this conversation and return to it another time if that's okay with you. Get off the call, leave the meeting, do what you have to do, compose yourself and reflect on it. 
ask yourself, is there another way I could be interpreting this? Or what I like to do is I like to consult my friend tours yes. and ask them, have you come across this in your career or in your life? How did you overcome this thing or deal with this challenge or this conversation? How do you suggest I move forward with this conversation? And if you don't have a friend tour, maybe you could go to your mom or parent or friend or whoever maybe is in your life. Hopefully you have at least one person you can yeah. talk to. And if not, then reach out to me. So that's what I would say. And then the third step is really to come back to that person. If that is the best course of action. Otherwise, if it's not, you can forget it. It's just in the past. If you do want to address the situation, come to the table and say, hey, I don't know if this was your intention, but when you said this thing, it made me feel X, Y, Z. I would love if we could move forward or talk about it, if you could provide some clarity on what you meant, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And use whatever tips whoever else gave you, yeah. because this is very general. But I yeah. would say that's my best advice. Three steps. I love it. Take a deep breath. Assume best intent. The second one is to either ask in the moment for clarity or walk away. And when you do walk away, ask other people for advice. And the third step is to come back with that advice and to really hopefully mend the problem. I think these are such great steps, one for the workplace, but two relationships in general. You just had so many things going through my mind. You so openly shared about your relationship with your mom, which I've shared very openly as well. And I feel so thankful that my relationship with my mom is at the best place it's ever been, but it's taken a lot of hard work and it's taken a lot of deep conversation. And as you said, recognizing that at times she really was just doing the best she could with what she had. And I think what you said with that step one, most people are right. The clarity piece. I actually was listening to a podcast recently and someone was talking about romantic relationships with partners. And they were saying how something that they started doing in their relationship was like, if they're in, in if they're in conflict, like they, they communicate the thing that they were saying, and then they'd say, what did you hear? And that person would mm. respond and they'd say, oh, that is what you heard. But this is what I was trying to communicate like that, creating that clarity. And I know after I heard that podcast and I started implementing that in my relationships, game changing. You're so right. That clarity. But for me, Danielle, I have to be honest, like you saying about that third step of like how to approach that, that is always to me the scariest point because that mm. is so vulnerable to go back and be like, hey, this is where you hurt me. This is how I understood it. Being able to recognize that like the relationship might not be the same after that, but it actually might be better or it might not. As you said, it might be one that you walk away from and that's okay, but it might actually better the relationship. I found, and tell me if I'm crazy on this, but like I've found in my life personally, when people have come to me and said, I'm sorry for this, that those have been people that sometimes I end up being so close with because they were vulnerable enough to come to me and be like, Hey, I messed up. Like it, cause it sucks to say you're sorry. Like it absolutely sucks. Going back to that earlier story of being that fresh college grad who yeah. was being taken advantage of no yes. doubt, but also who couldn't really ex have those conversations. Con just conversations yeah like in a productive way mm -hmm. where the other person could hear it without it feeling like an attack yeah I wish I could have given her these tools at the same time like if you do find yourself as that person who avoids conflict or has a tough time with conflict or even that last step of coming back to the table and actually saying something and voicing something that's mm -hmm. something I talked with my friends about all the time and I always encourage them to just be to be that person, because if you really think about it biologically, the reason why your alarm bells are going off when someone says something, right, that doesn't resonate or <laughs> makes you feel uncomfortable is it's like a biological reaction, right? It's, oh, survival. I have to, there's something there that isn't sitting right with you. <laughs> exactly. Danielle, consider this me asking you to hold me accountable. I'm going to come back to you on some like step number threes. I'll report back good. on how it goes okay. and how it makes me feel 
more empowered and confident in approaching like conflict conversations. So thanks for sharing that yeah. for my sake, but for everyone listening to you've seen the TikToks and the videos going around of this is the millennial in the workplace. This is Gen Z in the workplace. I want to know what are your like traits from each that the other could take and be like, ah, yes, let me apply this to my work life. Is there anything that stands out to you? Also, can we maybe take the thing too that we're like, for fun, we can be like, oh no, this is something that maybe we shouldn't do in the workplace. I'll start at the top. So we have boomers. I think that my mom's a boomer. So I could speak from experience and working, living with her. I think that one of the things I admire about boomers is like their resolve. Like Mm they're, and oftentimes it's like, it comes out in the way of, oh, this is the way we've always done it. So let's like to keep doing it this way, which I don't think is helpful. But the other way that it could be looked at is we definitely need to get this thing done. Like the resolve to get stuff done and shipped and out the door, I think is like commendable. Okay, Gen X. I don't know this generation as well, I will say, mm-hmm. but I do know that they're the silent generation. <laughs> so like they- That's why you have, don't know them as well. <laughs> yeah, they, exactly. They like tend to keep it quiet. I would say just use your voice more, Gen X. (laughs) Just like follow your intuition to voice your opinions. But I do think that they're very empathetic, which I appreciate. And these are like such generalizations, but- Obviously, yes. Yeah. Millennials, I'll say I appreciate their their determination to change things. Yeah. And what I would- say to keep I don't really keep your kombucha I don't really I don't really want it I think it tastes gross and then Gen Z oof I know this one too I would say the ego thing is like so bad let's like get rid of egos that's just like disgusting we all have an ego and it's our job to learn how to make friends with our ego but just not let it control us yes and the second thing is I really appreciate how this generation is so willing to draw the line and to say hey I'm not going to work and just to like boundaries between yes. work and appropriate hours and non-appropriate hours to be working yes. yeah that's my I think those were all such great <laughs> answers I know it was a rapid fire and like a funny question but I know from it too that there are things that every single one of us can take, especially the kombucha. Oh my God, Danielle. I'm not going to stop <laughs> laughing about that one anytime soon. So yeah, I want to ask course. you one last question. I could ask you questions all day. Okay. Um, this is such a good conversation. I'm so invested. I love hearing you speak about I this. It. I could tell that you're obviously confident in what you're saying, but to just, this is truly your purpose and passion. It's amazing. But I want to talk about confidence and what does confidence mean to you I love that question actually funny enough just just wrote a whole tweet thing post whatever you call those things about confidence about being the youngest person in a room and not being afraid to stand out yeah Yeah. so I think confidence to me means having the courage and practicing that courage to be the strongest, most fulfilled, fullest version of yourself, yeah. no matter your environment. Unapologetically, baby. We love Unapolog- it. Unapologetically. Yeah, yeah, love. And I think in the context of my relationships, it's having the courage to speak up. Danielle, it has been so great having you on the podcast. You definitely boosted my confidence. And I know you boosted the confidence of so many people listening. I'd love to know where can we find you on all of the platforms so that we can keep just getting all of these great workplace and relationships and friend tour tools and resources to add to our toolbox to just feel our most confident in our relationships. Yeah, no, I love that. So you can find me mainly on LinkedIn and Instagram. Danielle Farage is just, it's garage with an F. So if you don't know how to spell it and also on my website, which is daniellefarage.com. 
Danielle, thank you for sharing that and for everything that you shared today. This was such a great episode. I can't wait for everyone to stay in touch with you on socials and to stay with in touch with us on socials too. Be sure if you're listening to this podcast episode on Spotify or Apple to rate and review the podcast so we can keep coming back to you every single week with Commonist Boosting Resources. Also, be sure to give us a follow over on YouTube where you can see all the images. You can see us laughing, talking with our hands. It's a great space to be. Also, if you're not already on the BodCon app, what are you doing? Come and join us on the app. We have great conversations going on there consistently. We would love to see you there and on Instagram at the BodCon, where we're always sharing all of the body confidence and beyond social posts. So thank you so much for being here. I can't wait till the next time. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Bod Pod. We release new episodes every week and we're available on all podcast streaming platforms and now YouTube too. Subscribe to our channels to be the first to know. Want to talk all things body confidence, enter amazing giveaways and hear updates about the BodCon 2023? Find us on Instagram at the BodCon. My name's Rachel K. Grimm and I'll see you next week.